Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be interviewing a renaissance man in the world of entertainment, Terrence H. Winkless. All of you nerds out there of horror know him as the screenwriter for the 1981 werewolf classic, The Howling, and he directed the 1988 uh, Canadian horror classic, The Nest. But he was also a member of Sid and Marty Croft's The Banana Splits, and he was the production assistant on John Carpenter's first movie, Dark Star. And I'm having him on the show today to talk about all that stuff. The guy's just had an amazing career. He directed uh, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers and so much stuff. And I can't wait. The Howling is my favorite werewolf movie of all time. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Terrence H. Winkless. Hey, Terrence. How are you? I'm great. How are you, sir? Wonderful. Did it say, did it say 503 on your uh, on the callback on this phone? 503. Would mean you're in Portland. No, I'm in Redding, California. Oh, uh, well, so. Close. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's close. It is close. Yeah. Uh, it's such an honor. Thank you for taking the time today. No problem. So, uh, going back in time, I mean, you've done many jobs in the entertainment industry, writer, producer, director, actor. Uh, did you gravitate towards the arts early on? I, uh, I did, I guess. My dad was a guy who generated uh, advertising, and I liked what I saw there, and it gave him the opportunity to do pretty much all the things that I've done, and uh, particularly put images on film. So I, I got I was I was struck by that and really dug it. So that's where I went. Nice. Were you uh, performing in school plays as a kid? I did once I got to high school. Yes. In fact, I had to make a terrible choice when I was a junior. I think I was a gymnast and uh, I became the captain of the team. But I was torn between that and doing the showbiz stuff for the plays. And went with the plays instead of being a gymnast. I didn't see any money in being a gymnast at the time. <laughs> well, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, as they say. Yes, it's absolutely true. <laughs> so did you go to uh, college to um, study film or anything? I went to the place that would accept me. I did not have great grades <laughs> in high school. I went to Southern Illinois for a couple of years, and they had one films class. Uh, it actually was about making newsreels. You were supposed to make a one-minute newsreel about whatever. Mm. And I made my one-minute film. I think it was actually supposed to be, I don't know, 28 seconds or something like that. Of course, I made an epic. It was a minute and a half. <laughs> uh, but the guy dug what I did. I, got, I really liked it. It was really fun. But it was the one class. It was the only class they had, so... In the meantime, I applied to USC and went to school there, which had, a, of course, a great film program. <laughs> so it was just a, a minute and a half film? Yes, and it was too long. It was, you know, the, the assignment was like 28 seconds or something, maybe 20. I really have forgotten. It's, it's quite a while ago. Wow. But uh, it, it was fun to do, so it, it whetted my appetite. Yeah. According to research... Uh, you and your brother were uh, performers on Sid and Marty Cross the Banana Splits. Two of my brothers, my brother Jeff and my brother Dan, who were all three in the suits. Wow, you're you all three. You were were um, in the suits performers then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My uh, my dad was a uh, uh, he made commercials and he worked with Hanna Barbera while he was making the commercials. And when he got wind that they were going to do a live action show, he said, I know the right guys to be in those suits. And he met me and my brothers. So I drove home from school in Southern Illinois on a Friday. And my mother said, you're going to go to California on Monday and try out for the show. Well, that wasn't really a tryout. My dad <laughs> knew perfectly well that we would inhabit these suits and do the right 
right things, and we did. Wow, I had no idea. Uh, what, what was that experience like? Uh, it was harrowing. It was it was it was great fun, first of all, but it was also one of the. Uh, it was it took a lot of. It's a good thing we were young and in great shape. Because we were in these suits for, you know, it's a 12 hour shooting day, and you, it was incredibly hot inside the suits. There were 40 pounds of carpeting. And uh, we went through like 15 t shirts a day, sweating through the t shirts and into the jumpsuits. The jumpsuits were there to protect us from the material that the costumes were made out of. So it was, it was harrowing. It was really hotter than hell. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but it was also incredibly great fun. The single biggest challenge being Bingo the Gorilla was seeing anything because the suit, the head, had this sort of stuff that keeps ping pong balls in place. It literally was the stuff that they use to keep ping pong balls in place when you buy six ping pong balls, which is that dark blue stuff. And then there was the sunglasses over the dark blue stuff. So I had about... I don't know, 25% of my normal vision. And, of course, we're driving these little, they're called amphicats, these sort of buggies that go everywhere outside. I couldn't see a thing. I ran into a cyclone fence at the top sea, which is only, fortunately, about 25 miles an hour. But they were they were incredibly unsturdy devices, these amphicats. We kept tipping them over, and I don't know. It was uh, the, mostly tipping them over. That was the big danger, which we did a lot, but... They didn't weigh very much, and we were young and athletic and would throw them off and go on. Yeah, it's, it's like being a mascot for a sports team, except, you know, when you're... Very, very, very much like that, yes. Yeah, except for when you're doing that, though, you're, like, jumping around and staying warm. <laughs> and how. Uh, so I think it paid a lot better than uh, what mascots get. I think they do that for fun. We were getting sag scale. Mm -hmm. That's a lot which of money. Is a lot more, which is you know pretty good money. Yeah, and you guys had such a wonderful cast of talent. You guys had J. Michael Vincent, Jay North, Sherry Lewis, Alan Melvin. I mean, that's a great cast. That was. I never met any of those people because I was inside a suit jumping around, and the guy who did my voice was a guy you know. I didn't need to meet him. They did playback on set, and we would move our mouths to what we heard. Mm -hmm in an effort to make it seem like the Bingo the Gorilla character was talking. And same with Juber and same with Flegel. Flegel was uh, Paul Winchell and Alan Melvin was Drooper and Dawes Butler was Bingo. Mm -hmm. And there was nobody for Snarky because he didn't speak. He was like uh, the which the which Mark's brother just had the horn. Uh, oh, Harpo just Harpo. had the horns. Uh, so it was was uh, uh, snorky he just honked <laughs> <laughs> did you see the new uh, banana splits movie i didn't i didn't i, I considered it a sacrilege still do <laughs> i don't have any reason to watch that yeah I, i'm with you on that i haven't seen it either and some people said it was just it was just really bad <laughs> it doesn't seem like uh, the banana splits should ever have anything to do with a horror movie it doesn't make any sense to me as I say, sacrilege. Yeah. I said it a, online, I don't know how many times. Yeah, it's a total sacrilege. Yeah. <laughs> so after the show ended, um, did you decide that uh, you would rather focus on getting behind the scenes and writing and directing than doing performance? Uh, the timing for me was very lucky. While I was shooting the show in the summers, I, had apl I applied in, uh, to school at USC which had a vast, vast film program. And indeed, I uh, was happy to make the dough inside the suit because it allowed me to go to USC, which was quite expensive. And still, I imagine, is quite expensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were a production assistant on John Carpenter's first film, Dark Star. Yeah, that overstates it a bit. I mean, I did a bunch of stuff with John. We were roommates and, you know, pals and hung out. And uh, I operated the, I guess I did, I guess you got to call me something. I guess the guy who operates the Tomato Monster's feet has got to be called something. You can't call him Operator of Tomato Monster's Feet. 
<laughs> but I, I guess I did more than that. I did find him a stage to do some reshoot stuff. What was that over on Western Avenue? And uh, yeah, yeah, sure, I did a bunch of stuff on that show. Mm -hmm. So you were his roommate. Um, did Did you know or feel that he would become the great filmmaker that he became? Um, yeah, so it was a sense that he would uh, do stuff, big stuff. He, he was the only guy who who had pictured it when he was in high school or maybe even grade school and uh and you could tell you know he, he could indeed tell that he was going to do stuff mm -hmm. what was uh, dan o'banion like in those days <clears throat> dan o'banion was the one of the most peculiar people i ever met <laughs> he ha had a house down the he had a room in the house there were big houses near usc where we went and he had a room in one of the old houses, and there was the tallest collection of porn I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> near the end of that. I mean, it was really it just, it was a tower. And uh, it was, and, but he was also a heck of a, a fine writer and uh, extreme fellow. Yeah, I've heard the stories about him. Um, hanging out in strip clubs, and that he you know, he was a very complex guy. I mean, uh, the, the legendary stories about when he directed The Return of the Living Dead are just, you know, they, they got to be true. <laughs> yeah, I, I imagine a lot of them are, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I sat on a panel with his wife uh, a few years ago, something I made that Dan was in, mm -hmm. uh, and he, we couldn't, they couldn't get Dan, so they got... Uh, What's her name? Um, I'm drawing a blank. Anyway, she was very nice. It was nice to see her. It was nice to know that she was there for Dan uh, in the later days. Oh, that's good. That's good. Her, her name will come to me eventually. Yeah. <laughs> so Maybe when we get off the phone. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> so did that lead to um, second assistant directing on Gone in 60 Seconds? That's a sort of in uh, uh, another misnomer, um, I was an editor for a guy uh, that I'd known when I was a banana split, ironically. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was an assistant editor, and I was thinking up these dailies, and there was all these car chases. And my job was to, you know, put the sound of this car wreck with that car wreck. And eventually they brought in some scenes that were really poorly done that were dialogue scenes. And I said, you know, um, I was an aspiring writer. I was working for this guy during the day and writing at night. And I, I made a deal with the guy who could bring it in this stuff. If you'll let me direct the scenes that I write, I will write some scenes for you that make sense because what he was writing just didn't, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. So he said, yeah, sure, I'll do that. And he didn't really want to relinquish uh, you know, I would set up a shot, and he didn't really want to relinquish any power to me. Uh, so I sort of had to do it behind his back. But uh, I did succeed at doing it behind his back, and the, the things improved. And um, and I so, so really what I did on that show was direct the dialogue scenes, which are not great. You know, it's all cast with people from his real life. Yeah, yeah. The guy, who, the woman who played his wife was his wife or his girlfriend, whatever she was. The guys in the shop were guys who worked in his shop. So no matter what we did, the acting wasn't going to be, you know, brilliant. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> but it was real, and that, that goes. It, 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 sure, it sure worked for that movie. It made a zillion dollars. Yeah, I, I never seen the movie, but when I read the title, it reminded me of the Jerry Bruckheimer movie. <laughs> Well, the Jerry Bruckheimer movie is based on the original movie. He bought the rights. Oh, I didn't know that. I did. Remade it, yeah. You know, you got to get 140 cars to the docks by Tuesday. That's the premise, and that's all it takes. Now you got to go steal all these cars to get them to the docks. It was <laughs> a great, it was a great idea. Uh, yeah, it's a pretty good movie. I, I just looked up Dan's wife. Her name is Diane. Of course, yes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> So, my favorite werewolf movie of all time is The Howling. Um, how did you get involved with writing the screenplay? It's a, a great and ridiculous uh, story. Um, 
I used to play softball on uh, Sundays uh, out at the beach. I lived in Hollywood, we'd go to the beach every Sunday so that we could play softball. But really, it wasn't just playing softball. It was to meet girls because it was a co-ed game. So the idea was to, during the week, meet as many girls as you could, invite them to the game, and then we could all meet new girls. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, we did that for, I don't know, for years out there. It was, it was great. And one day, uh, a guy named Jack needed a ride home from a guy named Kevin. Kevin was, Kevin had worked at, uh, I don't know, one of the big agencies and played in the game. And there was a script of mine in the back of Kevin's car. And Jack said, can I read the script? And Kevin said, yeah, sure. And uh, it turned out that Jack knew a guy who had gone to, actually he went to NYU, I think. I think, I think that's where they went to school with a guy named Mike Fennell. Yeah. Fennell was one of the producers on The Howling. Right. Jack said to Mike, I just read a great script. You should read it and consider. And anyway, he did, and I wrote the script. Wow. The middle draft. I think they got the guy with the book to do one draft. They didn't like it at all. And then I was the next in line. Did, did you like the yeah, book? Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. Did you like the book? The book? Not really. I mean, it was about a random girl who gets attacked by a random werewolf. And it all takes place sort of in the city, and it, it it just needed a lot of detail added to it. And uh, you know, I I did one draft of detail, and John Sales did the next draft of detail, and it, and I thought it worked out really good. When I saw the movie in the uh, in the theater, I thought it was great, and it didn't awesome. bother me that it wasn't exactly what I wrote, because that's you know it's a process that goes through a lot of changes, and yeah. There you are. Yeah. Oh, that's that's great that that you like the uh, final result. A lot of writers wouldn't say that, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know that's life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was, and I knew what it, I knew what it was like to be a director, so I couldn't. You know, I thought Joe did a great job, and he was, was a great guy. He was great to work with. Yeah. Did uh, did your draft have humor in it, like um, the final movie did? Uh, I think so. Not as much, I would say, as what sales has added. Uh, but, yeah, you know, I, I have a sense of humor. <laughs> and I tried to apply it. So there you are. I know the movie has a great balance of humor and, you know, scariness. You know, Rob Bottin's makeup was just brilliant for that movie. Yeah, it was fantastic. And it was the first time anybody ever did a pneumatic werewolf like that. Yeah. And, you know, from my point of view, it was... The, the, the thing changes. The guy transforms. All I can write is the guy transforms. I can't tell you step by step how it's going to be done. That was Rob Bateen's bit. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. And, the, and he did the same thing for the Landis movie, didn't he? Oh, no, no. Um, Rick Baker did uh, American Werewolf in London. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's and, right. and he was originally supposed to do the makeup on The Howling, but then he recommended Bottin for it, you know. I knew there was a connection. Yeah, the, he was like mentoring uh, Botin from what I from what I heard. Right. right. Did you write the the story for He's My Girl? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, they had a great premise. Uh, guy wins contest and uh, and goes on a, a rock and roll band tour. Right. And they put me. It was great to get the gig, and they put me on a bus with uh, the Lita Ford band. Uh, she had been one of the runaways, I think. Uh, and she was, you know, she was a great band, had a great time with the guys riding around the bus for two weeks, had a great time. Uh, and so did they. And I wrote what happened on the bus, uh, mm -hmm. or what happened during the tour. They had no interest in it. Forget this. We, <laughs> we want to do something else. So, uh, the only reason my name is on He's My Girl is that it's worth a little bit of money. Yeah, I, I love that movie. I used to watch it on HBO when I was a kid. Really? Really? Oh, well, there you are. You know, different strokes for different folks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got the you. The only way to keep your, you get your money out of it is to keep your name on it. Yeah. So, I get my name on it. Yeah, I interviewed an actress from the movie about a year ago and stuff. 
Yeah, I like that movie. Um, how did you get into uh, directing with The Nest? My uh, agent at the time did me the one biggest solid he ever did me was getting me a meeting with Julie Corman, mm -hmm. which was based on, the movie was, I mean, the meeting was based on a, the film I did when I was in college called uh, Foster's Release, uh, which was also a, a girl, it's, it's the babysitter story, you know, the babysitter gets trapped in the house with a guy who calls, and I did it first. Uh, and hey, people have done it since, God knows. But I did it first, and that's the movie that O'Bannon stars in. He's mm -hmm. the bad guy. He's the breather on the phone. Yeah. I and 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 uh, that's the long and the short of it. I did a good job on that, worked it all out in advance, and figured out how to make a movie for a dime. And got sent. That got sent to Julie Corman, and she said, Ah. You figured out how to make a movie for a dime. Well, we're going to give you more than a dime, and we're going to give you 24 days, and a, a crew of, I don't know, it was a big crew. It was not Union, of course, but it was a big crew. Mm -hmm. Off I went. I was reading um, the studio was roach-infested for years after the movie was made. <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised. It was a battle. Uh, my favorite story about that is that uh, I would order X number of roaches. I don't know. You don't know how many to order, right, when you're beginning. How many orchards? How do you, how do you know? Yeah. Let's say 5,000. So I would ask for these uh, 5,000 roaches. And the people who supplied them would come in looking exhausted. And I was thinking, how come you people look exhausted all the time? Well, we're out collecting roaches. What do you mean collecting roaches? We're collecting them off the street. Really, because I figured they were just, you know, making them, they must thrive incredibly if you try to breed them, right? I mean, those to be a zillion. No, nope, they're picking them off the street in, in Van Nuys. No wonder they look exhausted all the time. They're out collecting <laughs> roaches off the street. Are they out of their minds? Just breed them for, for Pete's sake. <laughs> but there you are. What was it like to work with Lisa Lingua? She was, she was very pleasant. I'd seen her in, I forget what, and went out of my way to cast her, uh, and uh, I, I, it, was, it was fine. We had one incident where she, she was, uh, you know, but all actresses are a little freaky. Yeah. And uh, I remember her once, she was, I was giving her instructions, she stopped in the middle of it, and she said something like, I, I, I can't hear you, my hands are frozen, or something like that. Yeah. And uh, she had to stop and walk off the set and, and gather her wits. And I looked at Robert Lansing, whom I'd also gone out of my way to cast, and said, what is he? said, she's, I don't know, Terry, she's an actress. What are you going to do? Or something like that. Yeah. And uh, But but she's, uh, she's still a friend, and we're in contact on Facebook and stuff like that. Yeah, I had her on the podcast a couple of years ago. She's a very interesting lady. Yeah, yeah, and Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> Is it true uh, Stephen Davies ad-libbed all of his lines? Not all, but Davies is one of the great, he is a great ad-libber. And that scene, there's a scene when he first meets the sheriff, mm -hmm. and he hands, the, he hands the, the motor scooter over to the sheriff so he can walk it down the street. And Davies just winds up rolling uh, a cigarette on, on the fly and doing his dialogue as they go. He's the, he is a great prop actor and great uh, yes he made up a lot of stuff <laughs> <laughs> and then you directed blood fist are you a huge karate fan no um, i wasn't a huge karate fan before that movie but um i was extremely excited to get it because i had just come off of the net as you know mm -hmm. and anything that the that the monsters in the nest had to do we had to manipulate every single little bit right and you had to figure out all in advance just everything so when i got to uh blood fest all of a sudden i've got guys who can kick guys in the head from a standing position without you know thinking about it just boom and i went oh this is fantastic i don't have to figure out every single frame in advance <laughs> and it was great uh i i did figure out how to combine 
different locations with other locations by just finding something that would tie them together, a vine or a tree, whatever the hell. So that became the main event of putting the uh, blood fist together. Mm-hmm. Because indeed, you put a you know, camera at Don Wilson and suddenly he's kicking a guy in the head, just boom, you know, so fast, you can't even believe it happened. So that was that was fun to do. Mm-hmm. You basically did it because you wanted to see if you could do it. Well, it was a gig, you know, and I uh, hadn't worked in about a year, and, and I think Roger's other guy bailed on him, and uh, he offered it to me and said, you've got... Ten days to get your life together and go to the Philippines. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> <laughs> and then, how did you get into uh, directing television with Mighty Morphin Power Rangers? I uh, had done a, the a second karate movie, um, Rage and Honor, and the guy who shot it, uh, I ran into him one day, and he was shooting. I think he was shooting the Power Rangers, or he knew people who were shooting. Anyway, they were doing all this stuff, and they were going through a lot of directors, I think he told me, because they couldn't find anybody quite who knew what he was doing. And so I, you know, I called them, I got an interview, and they, they gave me the gig. They went out of the way to see if anything that I made edited together, <laughs> which it did. They could look at the net, and they could look at Blood Fist, and I said, yeah. You're on, buddy, whether you like it or not. Uh, was that, I did like it. It was great fun. Was that a hard show to shoot? No, not really. Um, it was... They, nothing was expected uh, that was uh, meant to be extraordinary or anything. It, it, it wasn't like... You know, when you do a movie, you, you, there's one clock, and you have to make this clock, right? Mm-hmm. Not like... Why am I using a clock as an example? Uh, they used to ask my dad what time it was. He would tell you how to build a watch. That's why I'm using a clock. You ask me, was it difficult? I said, well, I'm not trying to build a watch or a clock. It was it was elementary. It was not difficult to shoot because they didn't want... They, they didn't know how to tell me that they wanted something spectacular. And... Uh, they didn't ask for it, so they got pretty ordinary stuff. I mean, there are six kids, <laughs> and you have to figure out how to photograph them all the time. So, you you know, uh, you do a lot of six shots. Guys, six people in a row, from the largest to smallest, or the reverse, or something like that. Yeah, did you ever work with a, a stunt girl on that show named Kim Workman? That's not familiar. And, in fact... After the first couple of years, I'm not sure. The they they created a dedicated stunt unit, so that I just had to deal with talking actors, and the stunt people were all off in their own universe. We would have a meeting and talk about what the expectation was story wise, but then they would go off and shoot it, which made all the sense in the world because you're trying to shoot fights at the same time that you're trying to shoot the drama of any kind, even though. It's not exactly heavy drama in the Power Rangers. Uh, it's impossible. You just you wind up spending all your time on the fight, which is the way it should be. I mean, action, you know, action takes time. There's no question about it. Dialogue is a lot easier to shoot. Yeah, she was a girl that went to middle school with me in the Bay Area, and during the hiatus from school, she would do stunts on that show because I think she was related to a producer on the show or something like that. What's her name? Kim Workman. Yeah, that's familiar, but I I don't I don't per se think I work with her. Yeah, whenever I'm at Comic Con and I see Power Ranger actors, I ask if they know where she's at now because like nobody can find her, and I had a crush on her in middle school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's a, a need thing with you. Yeah. <laughs> so you're still out there writing and directing, correct? Yeah, yeah. In fact, I'm working on a series now with my former and now present uh, writing partner, a guy I knew at USC, ironically. And, uh, you know, we've all both gone and done other things. He was uh, he produced a bunch of IMAX movies. Mm-hmm. And I did what I did, and now we're back together at it. We're writing a series about a woman I'm doing. Uh, and indeed, I'm going to Chiller, uh, what is it called? The Chiller. Comic-Con, the Chiller Fest. Chiller Con. Is, where I'm 
signing autographs as Bingo the Gorilla. It's in uh, Parsippany, New Jersey, uh, next week, uh, October twenty sixth, I think. Yeah. Twenty. Yeah. I think twenty twenty fifth, twenty sixth, twenty seventh. I have a lot of autographs to sign for three days, so <laughs> I'll, I'll be there. And indeed, Bingo the Gorilla will be there, and Drupal the Lion, and uh, Starkey the Elephant. Not the <laughs> last. My brother Jeff played Flegel. Mm-hmm. People a lot do a lot of people come to your table with howling posters. I uh, I don't know yet. I haven't been there. Oh, is this your convention I, debut? It's this my first. It's my debut convention. So wow. I don't know. Wow, you'll it'll like be it. Inter- it'll be interesting to see, won't it? Yeah, you'll you'll like it. Conventions are a lot of fun. Oh, I am I'm sure. <laughs> So do, do you have any? Uh, so um, you're 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 mentioning the the projects and stuff. Anything you can specifically talk about, or is it too early? You mean to talk about uh, the name of the project is La Americana. She's an Hispanic doctor uh, dealing with a lot of <clears throat> immigrant issues, including her own. Her mother's a uh, an undocumented immigrant, and she is a DACA recipient. So it's all about all of the stuff that's going on on the border. Uh, it's set in San Diego. And as I say, it's called La Americana. Nice, nice. Well, I'll be keeping an eye out for it when it comes out. And Thanks. I thank you so much for coming on today, Terrence. I, my pleasure. I hope you got everything you wanted. Oh, I sure did, sir. And I hope uh, you have a great time at ChillerCon next weekend. Thank you. When, is this, when are you going to air this? Oh, today. You're, you, you are, you, later today, you're going to edit it that fast? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, and where do I listen to this? On YouTube, on my, my channel, Tommy Kovac. That's right. I remember. I, I, I looked at or listened to a bunch of them yesterday. So that I, I knew what I was up against. Thanks, Tommy. It was a pleasure. <laughs> my pleasure, sir. You have yourself a great day. You too, man. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Terrence H. Winkless. Ain't he a cool dude? Thank you so much, Terrence. I really enjoyed your stories from a Renaissance man in Hollywood. Or Vancouver, as you live at now. Well, that's all. Well, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.